My name is Anthony Metzger. I'm a winemaker and a sommelier. Here at Wines of the World, I Skype and record interviews with winemakers from around the world. On today's episode of Wines of the World, I have a really fun interview with a winemaker named Lloyd. Lloyd is from New Zealand but will be joining me live from the UK. He'll be sharing with us exactly what it's like to travel the planet and make wine. Hey. Hey Lloyd, how you doing? Good man, good. So, um, well welcome to the show, Wines of the World. Thanks for being here. Not a problem. Yeah, and so um, you're a traveling winemaker. Where are you from originally? Um, I'm from New Zealand. You are? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I could so kind of tell by the accent. Yeah, yeah, it gives <laughs> it away. Yeah. Sure. And so you're going to be moving back to Australia to do a harvest here pretty soon. Uh, back to New Zealand to um, Tohu in the Awatiri uh, Valley. Okay. Yeah. And what kind of wine do they make over there? So, because it's in Marlborough, it's uh, predominantly uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. But also, they do they do some really good bubbles and like pretty good Pinot as well. Sure. But yeah. Nice. Mostly sad. Sweet. Okay. Nice, nice. So, what would you say? Because you have worked in Australia, what would you say is the difference between the New Zealand wine and Australian wine? What's kind of the distinct difference between those two wine producing countries? Um, well, I think predominantly Australia is red wines and we're sort of predominantly white wine. Okay. Like definitely it's your sort of flagship varieties. Mm -hmm. But um, so where I was in Australia, was, I was in, well, just out of Margaret River, really. Sure. Um, and that, so that's in WA, which is not really the same as the rest of Australia. Okay. Um, and how so? Uh, it's, well, it's on the other side for one thing, you know. It's probably one of the most isolated places in the world. Yeah, because uh, it's right below Perth, the city of Perth, right? Yeah, yeah. And I so heard that's probably, like the most isolated city on Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're three hours nothing, below that. <laughs> see, like, you can look on the map behind you and there'll be nothing from Perth all yeah, the way to yeah. India, you know. So, yeah. And then it's pretty much the same going the other way, except it's desert, you know? Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. What um, is it like living in the most isolated place on Earth? What do you do for fun during the day? I mean, obviously you're a winemaker, so you work, you're working the harvest, but then once you, you're done working for the day and you got a weekend off, what do you do over there? Uh, well, the, like the beaches around Margaret River are just amazing. Like, really? flat out amazing. Wow. Uh, I, do, I do like a lot of sort of distance running. And running. so when I was, oh, okay. yeah, running. So when I was there, I was like, I'd finish work and I'd go for a big run down the beach and then have a swim and a nice. and a beer or a glass of wine and watch the sunset, you know. And then oh, back sweet. Back. It was actually probably one of the best vintages I had. Really? Just, yeah. Living the dream. So you uh, done a harvest in Canada. Yeah. What was it like for you to travel to Canada? Because for you, that's almost the opposite side of planet Earth. Um, so they had like a, a stupidly hot summer. Oh, really? And like, yeah, it gets really cold up there, but also like it's, so it's, where I was is maybe, oh, like I'm going to say about 200k north of the US border. Okay. And like a really big wide valley and they get like a stupidly long, hot, like hot summer. Really? Oh, okay. So, um, like the winery I was working at sort of specialized in, uh, Pinot Noir and Riesling, like it did exclusively Pinot and Riesling. And they grew but, it themselves or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. But like the main varieties around the region were like Bordeaux blends and, mm -hmm. um, like a Bordeaux style Sav, Sav Sem. True. So yeah, like it's definitely not what I expected at all from Canada in that aspect, you know, yeah. I was it's going to be like bubbles and Riesling and. Yeah, Maybe you would think Pino, you white know? and hybrids, but yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting. I think that's what the rest of Canada's like, to be fair. Sure. This one just has a nice microclimate that they can get away with growing Pinot Noir yeah, and yeah. such. If you could make a harvest anywhere on Earth, where would you where would you go? Even if they're not producing wine right now, if you could go anywhere on Earth and make some wine, what would be where would you like to go? Um I think Champagne would be would be one I'd be really interested in. And why is that? Um, 
I just sort of like the whole like the bubbles wine making is like sort of really interesting and stimulating. But of course, you'd have to follow on and do the tirage and everything as well. Yeah. Um, with that. But yeah, that's probably yeah. Probably champagne. champagne. That'd be cool. Yeah. In your opinion, what is it that makes a good winemaker? It's like um, I think that you need to be quite in tune with, with like what markets you're making the wine for, because like you can be a good commercial winemaker, but that doesn't mean you're going to be considered a good winemaker by other winemakers. Sure. Or sommeliers, you know, there's different levels of wine and different requirements for for making them. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the main things is like an understanding of the the region and the ter- terroir and the microclimates of the vineyards, um, how to handle the fruit to bring out the better flavors that the sure. fruit's got. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Really, really have an understanding of the fruit and what, because the winemaker really has to work around the fruit that he or she receives because yeah, wine yeah. making is you just kind of guide guide the juice and turn it into the wine through the fermentation yeah. process but it's really all up to the grape so the more you can yeah, understand yeah. your grapes um and the flavors and and what you can do with it the better off you'll be right yeah exactly so there's like there's aspects of it that you can use to to bring forward things of the fruit mm-hmm. like and you can do more or less whole bunch you know you sure. can macerate it longer um skin contact more solids in your juice, all sorts of things like that. But at the end of the day, you can't actually add anything into yeah. it. Yeah. And you can't really take anything out mm-hmm. either. So, yeah. So you've obviously got a lot of experience traveling and, and uh, making wine and being all over the place and whatnot. What would you recommend to a young person or, heck, even an older person who's thinking of quitting their job and getting into winemaking and wants to become a winemaker and, and travel and do vintages abroad, what would you say to the to he or she or what would you recommend about becoming a traveling winemaker? As long as they're not in it for the money, like as long as they're in it for like the lifestyle and sure. because they love wine and they love food and they want to see new places, like go for it. Mm-hmm. Like just jump in and do it. Find somewhere to take you for a vintage and do it. Yeah. Yeah. just go for it huh <laughs> yeah 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 so here's a kind of a fun different question it's um if you could have a bottle of wine any bottle of wine on earth or any bottle of wine from from history going back from the beginning of wine producing and you could drink it with any person on earth right now or from the past what wine would you drink and who would you drink it with well, the bottle of champagne that Winston Churchill opened at the end of the Second World War, you know, like that'd be pretty oh, that'd interesting. Be yeah, but like you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot about wine that you taste and that you have is like the memories of the occasion. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, and I couldn't tell you who I'd want to actually drink it with either, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. I mean, I was just reading today as well that they opened up like a hundred and thirteen-year-old wine like back home in New Zealand from Martinborough and that was apparently still tasting good and that's quite surprising like something like that would be interesting to see as well sure um, so that's the oldest New Zealand wine ever drunk obviously okay 113 year old bottle of wine they just opened and it's still good huh yeah yeah apparently and what makes yeah, it yeah. why Why can a wine age that long what it, What makes it survive uh yeah well, high acid and big tannins the acidity and the tannins yeah yeah so yeah, I mean that that would be an interesting one to try. That'd be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. Is there anything else? Any other wine stories or anything that that have occurred in your life as a winemaker? Um, I don't know if it's like super appropriate, but like another thing that happened in Margaret River was like, I don't even know if it's legal to be honest, but <laughs> on the way to work, like. Because there's just kangaroos everywhere there, like dawn and dusk, you know, like they're all over the roads and that. Yeah. Like we, we hit one on the way to work. Oh. <laughs> so, like, like it, it wrecked the car, like this little Ford Fiesta, because it's what you do as a traveling winemaker, you know, like shitty small cars. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but like, so this kangaroo made a mess out of it, like lost the bonnet and the bumper and everything. Jeez. Wow. But, like, so the kangaroo went into the boat. We got to the winery and, like, skinned it and boned it out and took the legs and... The kangaroo went really well with um, with the Syrah from from just south of Margaret River that the winery made, like kangaroo steaks and Syrah for dinner. 
steering out over the beach. Pretty good dinner. <laughs> That's probably like one of my favorite memories from winemaking. Are you serious? Wow. Yeah, serious, man. Dang. So you're on your way to work and you hit a kangaroo and you throw him yeah. in the trunk. Yeah. And you bring him to the winery and you butcher him and you cook him up. Well, and you... I, I didn't butcher him or skin him or anything. That was the other guy that I was with. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then how did you cook him? You throw him over a fire or what? Uh, just on the barbecue, yeah. Oh, just okay. Cut the leg, leg into steaks, basically. Sure. Kangaroo steaks and, yeah, West Australian Shiraz. <laughs> Match made in heaven. Do people actually uh, eat kangaroo typically or no? Uh, oh, it's there. Like, you find it in every supermarket. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what does kangaroo taste like? Uh, it's quite similar to venison, eh? Like, not quite as gamey, but like that sort of... Oh, it is. Okay. Sort of really lean red meat and nice. reasonably strong flavored. It's actually good, like as long as you like that gaminess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's a sweet story. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> nice. For sure. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers covers everything we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for talking with me about everything about your experiences. No Hope it was helpful. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Wines of the World. Make sure you check in next week as I will be interviewing another winemaker. If you have any questions that you would like me to ask a winemaker during any of my interviews, just reach out to me through my social media accounts, which you can find on my website, winesoftheworld.info. Be sure to check my website tomorrow and every single day of this week as I will be releasing some really fun, interesting wine stories. Thank you, and please be sure to subscribe.